Welcome back to Gap on Zoom. I'm Marty Emino, Gap's Director of Operations and Communications, joined here today by Assistant Communication Directors Tony Regina and Dan Schofield. And we're joined by two great ambassadors of the game that you see each week on Inside Golf Television. Well, well, sort of. Our first guest we don't see on the camera each week, but he's the man who drives the show from behind the scenes. He's Ken Selinger. Ken is the producer director of Inside Golf, Philly Feud, and What's Brewing, and this is year 23 for Inside Golf. So a long time show that's been the fabric of Philadelphia golf. So we'll get back to Ken in one minute. Also on the screen you see there and you see him on the screen each week is the host of Inside Golf, that's Harry Donahue. He's been the voice of Temple University since the 1980s and was recently inducted into the Temple Ring of Honor this year. So congrats on that, Harry. Thank you. He, uh, everybody knows Harry from his days at KYW News Radio where he was the morning news and sports anchor. And he did that for 35 years, believe it or not, folks. Think about how long that is before retiring in 2014. And he's also a member of the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame. So gentlemen, welcome. Now that we have the record button working, uh, <laughs> Ken, give us a thought. Uh, Inside Golf is 23 years old. You know, take us back to year one and your thoughts on getting a golf show on television. Well, the idea was presented to us by the uh, director of the Philadelphia section. Uh, they wanted to promote the local golf pro and differentiate them from the from the touring pro. And uh, what was Comcast Sportsnet back then was just forming and they were looking for some programming particularly in the golf area so we fit into that and uh, actually uh, two of our uh, feature reporters back then Leslie Goodell and Neil Hartman who were there uh -huh. back then so, uh, so we started it we launched the show in uh, the first week of January 1998 they went on the air in October of 1997 so we've been pretty much on their air ever since the existence and of course the progression now to to NBC Sports Philly. So uh, when we do it 52 weeks a year. So it's a show we we need to fill a half hour uh, each week. So and and Harry take us through how how you got involved with the show. Well, uh I've been involved with Ken as uh, Marty mentioned uh my job at Temple going back into the 80s, and Ken at the time was uh, producing a coach's show for Temple University. It started out as a football show with somebody by the name of Bruce Arians. That's how far back we're talking. And I used to co-host the show with, uh, with Bruce, and uh, that was how my relationship with Ken began. And then if you fa fast forward a little bit to when he got the golf show going, that would be a Frequent guest on the show, the, uh, I think the best part of the show, without hurting anybody's feelings, is uh, our teed off panel, of which Marty has been uh, a participant in the last few years, where four or five guys sit around and just talk about things that are going on, trends, whatever, in the game of golf. So I would be a, a frequent participant in that. And then uh, about eight years ago, Ken was looking for a new host. And I guess he drew on his memory bank and realized that maybe I could help him out a little bit. And it's been my pleasure to do just that for the last eight years. <laughs> so, so Harry, tell us what's your favorite part about the program? You know, you said the teed up. Is that your favorite section of the show? I think teed off is is a favorite um, in in some ways, simply because uh, it's a great group that we normally assemble uh, every week to do. Uh, a panel discussion on, like I said, whatever topics are going on in golf, maybe a little history, trivia, whatever. But uh, it's fun to get a very loose, it's very unstructured, as you know, Marty, from having participated mm -hmm. in it. The only structure about it is I send out a list of topics that we are going to consider, and then uh, everybody's free to say whatever they want. The only restriction is time, and it usually goes about five or six minutes. And I think you'll agree, a lot of crazy things happen during the taping of the show, as is one to be. It's like a live show, only it is taped. But uh, I think we also add a little perspective, some information and entertainment to uh, local golfers. And I, I really have fun doing that. But the other neat part, and you talk about the evolution of inside golf. As Ken mentioned, it began primarily with uh, maybe some profiles of local pros in the section. Then it got into profiling golf courses and both public and, and private, which I think is always interesting, and history uh, prevails there. But uh, also, 
I've done in the last few years a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews with people, mainly uh, icons in the game of golf, specifically to the Philadelphia area. And uh, recently, uh, for instance, I did a, a sit down with Jay Siegel, who crosses over from being a great amateur into being a pretty successful member of the Champions Tour. Uh, I think he won like eight times on the Champions Tour. So he didn't turn professional, as you know, until he, he got to the 50-year-old bracket. But, and by the way, uh, an amateur record, I think, not just in Philadelphia, but in the country, that is second to one. <laughs> and that one would be maybe Bobby Jones. And I get maybe, that from right? no less an authority than Gordon Brewer, who also was one of my guests in a sit-down one-on-one interview. Anybody that knows Gordon Brewer, know you talk about an ambassador to the game of golf, a great player, a great administrator, president of Huntington Valley for years, Pine Valley. Yeah. Uh, his son, very successful business part of golf, Chip with Callaway Golf. And uh, Gordon, to me, the finest gentleman I've ever met in the game. It was a pleasure to spend a couple hours with him. So you were doing a, I'm sorry, let me hop in here, John. Uh, so you were primarily a radio guy, I'm guessing, before Inside Golf. Did you do a lot of Temple Television as well? Like, was that part of your gig? It, it was. Uh, in okay. addition to, to doing the weekly golf show with the coaches, both with the football coach and basketball, John Chaney, uh, for several years, uh, I did play-by-play -play of Temple football. They Back in those days, you have to understand, we're not, the conferences weren't like they are today. So schools had to go out and basically arrange their own television schedule, be it football or basketball. Mm -hmm. And uh, Temple was an independent as football up until the mid nineties when they went into the big East early nineties. Uh, basketball was in the Atlantic 10, but they had their own separate TV contracts. And every year I would do maybe half the schedule in football and also uh, maybe about 10 basketball games. So then I got also working at channel three for about three years I was a weekend anchor on Channel 3 uh, News, uh, Channel 3's Eyewitness News program. So uh, then continuing on doing certain things with Temple uh, over the years. So TV was part of my background. wasn't as prominent as five days a week for 35 years on news radio. <laughs> I guess where I was going with that, and I, I apologize for not knowing all the background, but I guess where I was going with that is it, you got to get a little bit of a kick out of being kind of the face of golf in a sense, right? Now with, with the TV show every week? Yeah, sort of. Uh, I get a lot of recognition, regardless whether it's going out to a restaurant or going to a course to play. People say, hey, you're the guy from the golf show. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I admit it once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. The question to you was, and we have a little feedback here. Um, Ken, the question to you was about uh, how different Inside Golf is now than then. We may have to mute Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, Inside Golf format-wise uh, hasn't changed an awful lot. Um, one of the staples of the show right from the very, very beginning was our teed off segment where we invited uh, golf pros, uh, anybody from uh, the golf world to come in. We had uh, writers and broadcasters. Obviously, you know, Harry was a uh, a, a member of that course, a, a member of that team. And then we also uh, got into um, profiling new courses that were developing back then. We had uh, a lot of new courses uh, opening up uh, uh, back in the late uh, 90s and uh, early uh, 2000s. There were a number of them in the region. Uh, Fieldstone, uh, uh, Ravensclaw, uh, Glen Mills, um, Blue, I said Bluebell. But I mean, it was a it was a, an interesting thing because some of them, uh, Arnold Palmer obviously did uh, did Bluebell, and we uh, actually had uh, Arnold on our show, so that was exciting. So some of the early days, I think, helped us develop that audience. People knew that they could get golf talk and uh, good information about golf in the region. Well, what was the last episode you were able to shoot prior to the COVID nineteen crisis coming into effect? Well, we were down at the uh, merchandise show down in Florida and Orlando. So we did actually six shows down there. And, um, but we also did uh, a, a great interview. Harry did a great interview with uh, Jay Sigel. And uh, we went to his home and we talked about his career. 
so that was another uh, really good sh uh, good show that we've that we've done. But uh, and we had a lot of momentum uh, coming into uh, into uh, late March and April, and of course, you know, it sort of got uh, uh, canceled right in its tracks. But uh, uh, you know, we'll be back. Well, Ken, you, we, can't, we still can't see you, but we can hear you, so that's a good thing. Um, just tell, has the golf show in the Orlando golf show, you know, the big one, has that always been a staple of the show or is that something that's relatively recent? It has definitely been a, a staple over the last six, seven years uh, since I've been involved. It's something that we use for a number of reasons. One, for, for the information we get out of it, you know, whether it's new clubs, personalities, whatever. But it also helps us content wise at a time of the year when we're desperate for content because everything's shut down basically in this part of the country because of uh, winter time. And uh, we get anywhere from six shows this year to I think our highest number in the past has been eight shows. That's too much of programming at a dire time. And you really meet everybody. I mean, you know, I may run into Marty Emino down there. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I may run into David Ledbeck. Uh, right. Put you some high categories. I know they're funny, but that's the type of uh, you know the atmosphere down there. Yeah. I mean, it's it's totally totally unique. And but the fun part, we go down there. We have a certain schedule. We we hook up ahead of time and uh, plan an interview with somebody. One of my best just bump into type of interviews occurred with Jaime Diaz, the uh, famed writer now working mm -hmm. for Golf Channel, but in the past with Sports Illustrated, Golf Digest, whatever. And uh, Jaime had just taken his job at the Golf Channel. This was a couple of years ago. We were out at Demo Day at Orange County National. And I just was walking one way. He was walking another. And I said, Jaime Diaz, right? And I don't know if you've ever met Jaime. He's the most down-to-earth person in the world. I congratulate him on the new job. Ken was right there. I said, Jaime, you got a couple minutes. I'd like to just talk to you about your new career on TV with Golf Channel. And we had a fascinating time. I mean, I could have. I should have reserved them for about an hour because uh, we, we could have done three shows with Jaime Diaz. But that's the sort of spontaneity, and I think that's great. Plus, there's like, what, 100,000 people at the show over the course of three days or something like that. So you, you're always going to meet somebody who probably you never thought you were going to meet. And uh, I think our audience appreciated that. No, I was going to ask, uh, now you've obviously been on standby uh, with Inside Golf, given the state of the country at this time. Uh, what do you have in mind on the docket for when you are able to go out and shoot episodes again? Do you have a priority taping? If you have well, a, lot of, a lot of gap segments, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what else to think about. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you guys uh, <laughs> and, and whoever was involved. I mean, you were, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke, obviously, here, but, you know, like within minutes after word came from Harrisburg, that golf in Pennsylvania was going to be reopened. Gap was out there with its guidelines. And, I, you know, you guys obviously prepared, but I mean, it seemed like you must have spent really a lot of time and most like uh, knew exactly when Governor Wolf was going to make his announcement. So go into a little bit of what went on behind the scenes in terms of getting your members ready to go when the green light went on. And I think that's that could be a fascinating story. Plus, superintendents, I mean, they've been fortunate enough, in, at least in this part of the country, in GAP world, to uh, have been working on their golf courses. But as I read somewhere, uh, you know, their staff's been down. Maybe they've been limited. The weather's been okay. But uh, what the job that superintendents have been doing, uh, mm -hmm. they won't get any grief from people. They shouldn't, at least, on course conditions, I don't think. But uh, just, just what, into, what went into their planning? And once they found out, okay, here's the opening date, uh, how did they feel and uh, how prepared were they? I think that's a pretty good story. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll say that's, that's been the alliance for golf in Pennsylvania has been, uh, been all the groups joining forces together to be a collaborative has been uh, great with you know, communication with Governor Wolf and, and his people to make sure that when we could golf, uh, we are golfing, which will start, uh, not the date to show, but that'll start in the, in the tomorrow. <laughs> so exactly. that'll be fantastic. So, so Ken, uh, I know the stress that it, that goes into putting out a quarterly magazine. How stressful is it to put out a weekly show? It's got its moments. Uh, it certainly does. <laughs> I mean, the, the nice thing about, about what we do is that uh, the, 
the teed off segments that we do, we do multiple segments. Uh, so we'll do maybe six or seven segments at a time. So that whole segment can be, you know, pre-edited and ready to go and inserted in. Um, Harry will tell us what dates the, the topic will best fit into the show. So we work uh, on, on that. Um, other elements, I mean, it's a pretty much formatted show. Harry uh, does a great job in, in, in getting the interviews and so forth and, and the other content together. And then we have an editor, Stacy uh, Stacy Cross Martin, Stacy's dad, Ray Cross, was a former uh, GAP president. But um, uh, she does a great job in putting it together. And that's been her primary focus with us over the last, oh, a number of years now. And uh, so she's got that down pretty well. And she has a vast source of B-roll shots. You guys provide us things when we're doing one of your tournaments, uh, if we don't have everything. And uh, so um, we try to record a show about 10 days in advance. So if we're doing uh, a, a particular course, we would try to record this week for mid-May. So uh, considering that we're at April 30th. So that's, that's basically what our, uh, what our objective is. When we have to put a show together in a week, it can be pretty tough. For those of you out there who thinks it's easy, Ken does three shows. Ken, tell the people, how many full-time staff members do you have? Well, we have, uh, well, my son does our mobile unit, so I have to include him, but then we have okay. one who's, and we have a part-time, we have a couple part-time people that we bring in from time to time. But that's the economics of, of local TV. I mean, there just isn't the revenue, you know, to support, the local shows and uh, so we had to look at a way I mean, our inside golf show is is probably a third of the budget that it had you know before the uh, early what was it mid uh, uh, 2005 2008 in that particular period mm -hmm. and we just had to decide do we want to continue the show um, we had lost our our host and, and producer back in the day and that's when I reached out to Harry and he uh, uh, he agreed to work on it. So we work on a very thin budget. As you know, as you guys know, <laughs> it's just me out there with the camera. And, uh, you know, we're able to uh, to work. And we've, we've now incorporated a drone. And the drone actually helps us shoot because we can cover a lot of area with the drone where, you know, I don't have to set up and move around all the time. So the drone is able to cover different holes and things like that. So at any rate, uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a show that we're we're going to make it continue as long as we can, as long as we can get the support uh, that we have right now. Um, we're, we're okay. I think we ought to. You know, one of the things I'd like to do uh, once we get back rolling is put together a uh, best of inside golf. Twenty three is not like a twenty five year anniversary or twenty, but maybe it's time. Uh, we don't know how much longer Ken and I are going to be involved. To, Put together a best of and maybe some best outtakes. Maybe Tony, you'd be involved in some of that stuff. <laughs> uh, it's worth a shot taking a yeah. look at it and, uh, well, and yeah. seeing what goes on. I actually, you know, have been looking over our stuff. We started out uh, inside golf on, on three quarter inch tape uh, on a, uh, oh, a small three four format. And I turned a lot of those tapes over to the broadcast pioneers because we actually had some, some interesting shows back mm. in the day and they wanted to have those uh, those tapes so um, we did do when we hit 20 years a couple years ago we did go back and it's tough getting those three quarter inch tapes that have been drying out uh, to play back but uh, it was fun to look to look back and now of course we're all digital so uh, it's now all you know cards and that's it's storage space that we have to worry about now so it's it's not as easy as it might think to do a best of but Harry's got a great idea it'd be nice to be able to go back and look at some of our past shows. Maybe that best of uh, segment will include some clips of another individual on this call, Marty Emino. He's the featured yeah. correspondent for the Gap <laughs> segments on Inside sure. Golf. What's that relationship been like uh, between Inside Golf and Gap since it started a few years back for you guys? Well, we signed, a, we signed an agreement with Marty that none of his outtakes ever appear. So, <laughs> yeah, I had a good lawyer, baby. Good lawyer. <laughs> uh, that standpoint. But no, uh, you know, we really wanted to, uh, to, to broaden the reach of Inside Golf. So it was great when uh, we started working with you guys uh, several years ago. I mean, Gap had been involved for, for many, many years. And then for some reason, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, Gap events and Gap people involved with the show for like the mid-period. 
And uh, so now that we're back again, I think it really gives us uh, a, another dimension for the show, which, which is important to the local golfer. You know, another thing, uh, best of would be a good idea. Another uh, maybe topic I'd like to get into is uh, things you need to know about and whether it's an individual or a course. You know, we have a, in our area, uh, a former member of the Philadelphia section, who's still a golf professional, Pete Trenum. Pete Trenum mm -hmm. does a great job on, in terms of the history of uh, golf in the Philadelphia area, uh, personalities, things that you never realize were part of the, of the vast wealth of, of golf history uh, in, in Philadelphia, both professional and amateur. And Pete has it all up here. I mean, he's like, for instance, recently Doug Sanders died. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet Doug, not for the show, but just bump, literally bumped into him under the oak tree by the um, first tee at Augusta National a few years ago. And, and I talked to him. He started reminiscing about his years playing at White Marsh when White Marsh hosted a, a PGA Tour event. Well, turns out Pete Trenum was on the same golf team at the University of Florida in college with Doug Sanders. He said, one of the things he pointed out was he rarely saw Doug uh, except when they had matches. Doug wasn't a big student back in his day. So uh, <laughs> he didn't go to many classes. But uh, things like that, I think, that our audience would really appreciate. You know, I mean, there's, you could do so much with lessons and so much with equipment. But when you start scratching the surface about people in your area who have a wealth of information, uh, I love doing things like that. And, and a guy like Pete Trenum, uh, we had uh, Gil Hans on the show a few years back. It was right after the Olympics in Rio. And he, of course, had designed the course down there. And uh, he told us when we were preparing to interview him that he had one of the torches. He was a torchbearer for like 200 mm -hmm. yards. You know how they enlist certain mm -hmm. people to do that. And he was asked to do it. And he did it. And he said, in fact, I have a, one of the, the torch that I uh, used. I said, oh, really? I, I said, can you, uh, can you bring it to the interview? So he did. I think, where were we, Ken Ledrock? I, I no, French Creek. French Creek, yeah. So um, <laughs> he showed up and was in a case. And I'm like, wow, this is something, man. You're lucky to get this, you know, for them to give this to you. He said, well, well, wait a minute. He said, I had to pay $300 for this thing. <laughs> so here's, here's one of the most famous top architects of our time, uh, was awarded the chance to design the Olympic golf course when uh, golf became part of the Olympics again, and he had to pay for his own torch. But it was a pretty interesting <laughs> sidebar interview with Gil Hans. Nothing for free. Nothing's for free. You know that. Nothing. Right? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I just... You... Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. We all, we all spend a lot of time on golf courses and a lot of time with hundreds, thousands of different golfers. What do you guys miss most about being on the golf course? Good question. So many things. And when I look at the um, guidelines for the return of golf, in mostly everywhere, uh, it's, it's going to be a kind of a sanitized version of golf. I mean, like, for instance, New Jersey, only twosomes no foursomes. Uh, the 19th hole is going to go away for I don't know how long. And golf is such, you know, a, a social part of golf that people look forward to almost as much as, you know, making a 12-foot putt to win your match. So uh, I think just to get back there is fine. I think we're going to miss a lot of those little extras that have become part and parcel of people's golf experience, whether you play once a week or once a month or, you know, once a, once a day. Uh, people are going to adjust, though, you know. Nothing's going to stay the same. And golf, I think, if you look at the history of golf, the game itself, no other sport's evolved and gone through as many changes as golf. I mean, it starts with just where you play. I mean, every course is different. I mean, a basketball court is 94 feet long and the foul line's 15 feet from the basket. Baseball stadiums, give or take, have the same dimensions. Football fields 100 yards long and 60 yards wide. Those things never change. Every time you step on a different golf course, it's totally different. The only similarities are the ball and the hole. Everything else is different, how you get the ball in the hole. 
So I think, you know, golfers have learned to evolve. And I think if any sport can come back and, and still present its players. I mean, they talk about like football and baseball being played without fans. That's going to be a major difference, okay? At least golfers have about 80, 85% of what they were used to. And the other things, they'll adjust. And what about you? What have you missed? Well, we, we really, you know, the whole – the, the, the whole process of putting shows together week to week, uh, you know, that gets interrupted. And, and so, you know, you want to try to regain the momentum. I mean, we had lots of ideas. I think I've got, uh, Harry gave me a couple. I have a couple. Um, I met a guy the other, other week who uh, uh, talks about, uh, he, he, he goes way, way back. His name is, his last name is Valentine. And uh, Valentine has a lot of history with Marion and the, a lot of the turf mm -hmm. there and so forth. And uh, great stories, as Harry was talking about uh, Pete Trenum. Uh, he's got great stories. So, you know, it's been really interesting. I mean, I enjoy, for example, uh, the, uh, the uh, Jay Sigal interview. Uh, we did um, um, Gordon Brewer uh, uh, recently. Um, who else have we done major interviews with? Uh, but I mean, it, it, you, I just love learning about the game and, and doing all of this. Um, so it, it, it's a, one of those things with that, that uh, it's, it's going it's to take us a little bit of, of momentum. Or, you know, we're going to have to get our momentum back, I guess, is the way to say it, to, to get this going. But I enjoy getting out there. I would really like to take off clubs out on the course rather than a camera, but that's uh, the way it is. <laughs> you know, you, know you, you talk about interviews. This wasn't recent. This is maybe two years ago, and the fellow's still alive. I think he's about 98 years old. He used to work at Flower Town when George Fazio owned, owned and operated uh, Flower Town Golf Club in Flower Town, PA. And he told us one of his jobs as a maintenance man there was to build a bedroom for Gary Player. Here, Gary Player, when he first came over, from South Africa, worked as an assistant pro at Flower Town Golf Club mm -hmm. under George Fazio. And they needed, he, he didn't have any money, so he couldn't rent a, an apartment. So George said, let's build him a bedroom on the second floor of the clubhouse, right off Bethlehem Pike. And that's where Gary Player lived for a year. He used to go across the street on Bethlehem Pike to the Flower Town Diner for a milkshake and a hamburger every night for his dinner. And this guy used to go with him. And I mean, how many people knew that? <laughs> First no, of all, I didn't know that. let alone knew that he was there. <clears throat> and if this guy built his bedroom for him, you know. But, oh, Funny yeah, story idea, Tony. We, we stumbled across something like that. And uh, it's like, wow, really, Gary Player? This is, that was his first home in the States going back into the 50s when he was brought over here by George Fazio. That's a great story. Wow. Performers. Uh, Charlie Reimer was an interesting guy. Uh, we did... Mm -hmm. Charlie was still with Golf Channel. We met up with him uh, just kind of spur of the moment and then the following year, and he remembered us, and we, we did a couple things uh, with Charlie. Uh, we did a book with uh, Hank Haney, an interview. Remember when Hank Haney broke up from Tiger and then he wrote a book about mm -hmm. it, kind of a – was it a kiss and tell? I don't know. But yeah, I guess, uh, Tiger wasn't happy about it, whatever it was. Yeah, I don't think – I think I've talked to Hank Haney more than Tiger has. <laughs> <laughs> But we did, we did, uh, we did a thing with with Hank. Um, I, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, who was the, the the girl, the LPGA player, uh, Suzanne Patterson? Uh, yep. Ran into her route. This was before that little controversy. Remember where she didn't give a putt uh, mm -hmm. in the in the Solheim uh, competition. Uh, but she was Suzanne was was wonderful with us. Uh, Chip was Beck. just before the Olympics. I think she was going to be. Uh, yeah, she was getting ready for that. Yeah. Chip Beck's a character. You know, people uh, forget that uh, Chip Beck was on the tee at the Ryder Cup, the War at the Shore, playing with Paul Isinger when uh, Zinger got into it with Seve over how he, Seve accused the Americans of changing balls, which they mm -hmm. weren't allowed to do. Uh, Chip Beck's a real character and a great player in his day, by the way. But uh, you know, it's it's hard to say. I met Arnold. I met Arnold not through Inside Golf, but through my years at KYW a couple times. Uh, but just the local guys. I mean, you know, I, I keep coming back to like Gordon Brewer and Jay and, and Pete Trenum and uh, and and the, the guys made the bedroom for Gary Player. I mean, yeah. 
he's not an internationally known guy, but what a link to golf is with. Ken, what about you? Who's, uh, who's been the most intriguing or famous person you've met? I don't know. I, I really enjoyed Dal Finsterwald uh, that we got to do. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, he took us, uh, took us through Arnold's course down there because he's down there at Bay Hill living down there. And uh, we actually saw him twice. We did an interview with him the one year. And it was, it was really interesting because we went outside to do it. And uh, the, the sun was out, but, but it was cold on this patio. And uh, he wanted to get inside as fast as he could. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he, he was supporting himself with a putter. You know, instead of a cane, oh. he had a putter that he was walking around. I, I just um, follow in if I could here. Yeah. How we met Dow, uh, we became friends and did a couple shows with uh, Howdy Giles. Uh, I'm sure you guys may have heard of Howdy. Howdy mm -hmm. was very good friends, one of Arnold's best friends, was his dentist, uh, lives at Bay Hill, and took over 250,000 pictures, he estimates, of Arnold Palmer. There's a great book called The King and I, and uh, just, just an interesting, interesting guy. So we met, Dow was probably Arnold's best friend. They, they were born four months oh. apart, uh, played all the time together. Uh, Dow had uh, Arnold down at Athens, Ohio, to play in an exhibition match with the Ohio amateur champion, a kid by the name of Jack Nicholas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first time that Arnold ever met Nicholas, and it was through Dow. And then Dow's son, Dow was still alive, was in Bay Hill in Colorado. And uh, Dow's son, Dow Finstwall Jr., has been the head pro at um, Colonial in Fort Worth for 32 years. And I was in Fort Worth with Temple prior to the American Athletic Conference basketball tournament being canceled due to the virus. Oh, right, I, right. I had the chance to go to Colonial one day and also to Shady Oaks, where Mr. Hogan was a member forever. But uh, I met with Dal Finsterwald Jr. And uh, this was before the virus. Didn't have a chance to play, but went around the golf course. And he was looking forward to the resumption or – of the PJ Tour event, the Colonial, which is played there every year, Hogan won it five times. And then of course, everything hit the wall. But when the PGA Tour announced its first event in mid-June, where's it gonna be? At Colonial. Colonial, right. And it's gonna be without fans. And Dow Finsterwald Jr., hopefully, we'll see another year of the Colonial at his uh, great, great golf course here in Fort Worth. So, very interesting guy. But is that, we did an interview with Dow Sr. at Lanark, on the patio mm -hmm. overlooking number 18. And of course, in 1958, Dow won the PGA Championship at Lanark. So a lot, a lot of history between him and the Philadelphia area as well. First PGA Championship on TV in color. And the folk, uh, first metal play PGA Championship. Yeah, the first metal play PGA Championship. Prior to that, it had been match play. And Frank Cherkini, and that, that was the yeah. first event that he uh, <clears throat> directed for CBS. He had been working at the uh, WCAU TV. And there's another link to Philadelphia yeah. and golf and TV. And Chuck Will. Jack Whitaker. Uh, yep. Jack was on the show a couple times and a uh, great friend, of course, to have just to talk about history and golf. None better than Jack Whitaker, another Philadelphia product. Jack used so to come out to our studio before we even had him on the show, and he used to do. Uh, audio voiceovers for Golf Channel. He was doing some things back then, and he would drive up, uh, you know, to do that. And that uh, that was great. By the way, just to go back a little bit, uh, the Lan Arc and that uh, that uh, that tournament uh, back in the fifties, uh, and I go back that far. That was my <laughs> introduction to golf. My dad took me over there. Where I lived down that area, and it was not far away. And I, so uh, I didn't know the names, whatever, but it did get me. Uh, uh, into it, and then I started to uh, follow some of those golfers uh, and their careers. Wrap it up with this, Ken. Do you have an idea of when you're going to be able to start reshooting the show? Well, we're going to we're going to try to do something similar to what you're doing here, and I mentioned it to Harry. But we're going to do a teed off, and maybe have an expanded teed off coming up. I even mentioned it to you, Marty, and I don't know if mm -hmm. you got my, my little note, but uh, I'd like to do it very shortly and uh, get on. Uh, we have some programming scheduled on NBC. Uh, up until mid-May. I think it has two more weeks to go. And so I'd like to come right back with uh, with one of these teed offs. Okay, Harry, we could have probably sat here for another hour. Uh, lots of good stuff, lots of great stuff. So thanks for taking a few minutes this morning to, to chat a little bit.
about Inside Golf, how it started, and where we are today. Uh, for joining, Inside thanks for a couple of great Inside memories one. today. Really appreciate the time. And uh, we look forward to getting some new episodes on the air here soon enough. So for Tony Regina and Dan Schofield, Harry Donahue and Ken Sellinger, I'm Marty Emino. Thank you for tuning in today on Zoom, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.